Micah chapter 5, and we'll be reading verses 2 through 5a. And um, I'm actually going to read it twice. The first time, I'm going to read it from the Common English Bible, and then the second time, I'm going to read it from the message. So, here we go, the Common English Bible from the book of Micah, one of our minor prophets, who was giving voice to justice, but also to hope. Listen for the word of God. As for you, Bethlehem of Ephrath, though you are the least significant of Judah's forces, one who is to be a ruler in Israel on my behalf will come out from you. His origin is from remote times, from ancient days. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor gives birth. The rest of his kin will return to the people of Israel. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. In the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, they will dwell secure because he will surely become great throughout the earth. He will become one of peace. And then from the message that always offers a little twist, but you, Bethlehem, David's country, the runt of the litter. From you will come the leader who will shepherd rule Israel. He'll be no upstart, no pretender. His family tree is ancient and distinguished. Meanwhile, Israel will be in foster homes until the birth pangs are over and the child is born. And the scattered brothers come back home to the family of Israel. He will stand tall like an oak tree. He will stand tall in his shepherd rule by God's strength, centered in the majesty of God revealed. And the people will have a good and safe home, for the whole world will hold him in respect. Peacemaker of the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, Hildale, I am so excited to be with you. It is such an honor and a blessing to be here to join with you. Um, and my husband is here with me, Bradley. And at the late service, if she gets out of bed, um, my daughter Annalise will be here. Here's the thing, you know, when you have a college student, sometimes the priority to come to church might not be the top. So if you tell her, hey, hey, I'm preaching this Sunday. You hadn't done that before? Well, I don't know. Try it, try it. That means you actually have to preach. So anyway, who knows? I'm, I'm hopeful and prayerful that she will be with us at the late service, but I'm certainly um, very, very pleased to be with you. Um, it's hard to put into words to express when you are excited about something. We're going to be talking about that in the sermon. Um, so what I did um, to express my joy of being here with you today is I wrote a hymn for you. <clears throat> and if I don't get tickled, I, I, I'm going to sing it for you. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, Hilldale United Methodist, how gratefully I come to sing a hymn and share a word, but I will not play a drum or saxophone. <laughs> Your pastor sends his greetings this fourth Sunday of Advent. We hope this service is full of joy and it is time well spent. <laughs> I know, keep my day job, that's all right. <clears throat> but it's hard to express how excited you are about certain things. 
Advent is an exciting time. It's a meaningful time. It's the very beginning of our church year. And it's not Christmas. Advent is not Christmas. I mean, as much as we want Christmas to come, the children, can I get an amen? It's around the corner. As much as we want Christmas to come, Advent is not Christmas. It's a time of waiting. It's a time of preparing. We prepare our homes. We prepare to travel. We prepare for parties and guests. We prepare sugar cookies and gingerbread houses and Christmas trees. And most importantly, Advent is a time we prepare our hearts. I absolutely love your Advent theme. Um, Heaven and nature sing. I'm sure Kathy had nothing to do with this. I really didn't. (laughs) It's music, it's hymns. What a wonderful way to walk through Advent. Um, And you have chosen some of the most beautiful hymns, and I'm thankful to be able to spend some time with you on O Little Town of Bethlehem, a hymn that's actually intrigued me. And what would Advent and Christmas be without music, without hymns? Hymns are powerful tools for us in the church. They serve as a way to worship, a way to learn about God. Hymns teach us about history, about tradition and scripture. They teach us beliefs and theology. And sometimes they get a little personal and they reveal God's call, God's purpose, and God's meaning in our lives. And for me, maybe you too, hymns can inspire and motivate us to share the gospel, and especially this time of year, the coming of the holy child of Bethlehem. Oh, 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 little town of Bethlehem. Oh, do you know how many times just in our United Methodist hymnal that a hymn begins with O? Well, I asked your pastor this a couple of weeks ago, and he didn't know either. Um, He does now. He does now. So if you want to ask him, please do. He does now. But so you will know, in our United Methodist hymnal, A Little Town of Bethlehem is one of 51 hymns that begin with O. And I bet you know some of them. I, I can imagine. I don't know. Let's see. Help me out here. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Oh, you do. Oh, how I love Jesus. Thank you. Just making sure. Oh, worship the King. Oh, Jesus, I have. Good job. Good job. Was that you? Okay. Because you know already. You know the answers. Uh, keeping with our theme for today, that's your hint for this one. Oh, sing a song of the little town, Bethlehem. And then um, the service began with, oh, come all ye Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, it's such a powerful way to begin a hymn or really any statement. It infers an awe or an adoration, excitement. We can't quite describe it. It's the indescribable joy. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Oh, um, I'm so happy for you. Oh, let me tell you about my... Well, how would you finish that? I figured many of you would say, children, grandchildren. Oh, let me tell you about my grandchildren. Awe, adoration, excitement. Well, in our hymn for today, O Little Town of Bethlehem, this indescribable joy is no exception. There's a great story that goes with this. The story goes that it was actually the site of the little town of Bethlehem that motivated the writer, the text writer, Phillips Brooks, 
to write this hymn. He was a rector, he was a, a, an Episcopal priest, and at the time, he was at the Church of the Holy Trinity in Philadelphia. This is the year 1865. So he was on vacation in the Holy Land, and he and his buddy, I'm guessing another priest, they go on horseback from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. And the story goes that as they approach this dark, quiet Bethlehem, Phillips Brooks is filled with awe, filled with the mystery of this place, this holy place. And he writes the words to this hymn. Now, um, let's go a, a, a little bit further. This is 1868. Now, I I'm not really sure when this happened in the process, but he asked the organist if he would write the music to this old little town of Bethlehem. So the organist is Mr. Lewis Redner. Now, I I, I don't really know the timing. So he could have asked him two years ago, or he, he could have asked him like, a few days ago, but anyway, um, this big stature of a man, he was 6'8", Phillips Brooks, the Episcopal priest. He loved children, and he wanted very, very much for children to sing O Little Town of Bethlehem the Sunday before Christmas, the fourth Sunday in Advent, and he wanted a tune. So we asked the organist, write a tune to go with this text. So he goes to him on Friday, the Friday before the Sunday, fourth Sunday in Advent, and he says, so, Redner, do you have that tune yet for O Little Town of Bethlehem? And the organist said, no, not yet, but I'll have it on Sunday. So I... I don't really know if it was a matter of the pastor giving last-minute demands or if it was the organist who procrastinated. I don't know what. I don't know which it is. I've experienced both, but I'm not suggesting that would happen here. But anyway, that was the scene. So as of Friday, there was no tune. So Saturday night, Lewis Redner is so caught up in his Sunday school lesson. I mean, this is getting ready for the fourth Sunday in Advent, and we're going to have the children sing for the Sunday school Christmas service, and there's still no tune. So he goes to bed with no tune. And during the night, angels awake him with a tune. This is how the story goes. Angels wake him up with a tune, and he has it in his head, and he writes it down, and then he goes back to sleep. (laughs) I don't know how that can happen. Anyway, he goes back to sleep, and the next morning, he gets up and harmonizes it, takes it to church, and the children sing for the very first time in 1868, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Now, um, later they say that neither he nor Reverend Brooks ever thought the carol or the music would live beyond that Christmas of 1868. But guess what? It did. It did. It did last and has become one of the most well-loved Christmas hymns around the world. It's certainly not the upbeat joy to the world, and it's certainly not the lovely, sweet lullaby away in a manger. It's actually a little mysterious. I don't know. Maybe it's the tune Maybe it's the text that speaks of this little town with dark streets and casting out sin and talking stars. And the way that Brooks um, portrays it, um, it's certainly a, a little dark and eerie. It is not the expected birthplace for the king of love and light. I mean, not the birth location I would choose. I mean, really, if you were given the opportunity to choose the birthplace of the king, the birthplace of the son of God, where would you choose if you got to do that? Um, I don't know about you, but Leslie, would you choose Vanderbilt Children's Hospital? 
I, I thought you would think that. Or maybe somewhere majestic like a castle. I, I've been thinking the Biltmore Estate. I think the Biltmore Estate would be a lovely, um, holy, majestic place. And maybe like um, some year-round, very, very um, dedicated doctors and nurses, and maybe like a spa treatment for the mom and the dad. I mean, Mary and Joseph would really like that. Um, but Bethlehem? Bethlehem. Mysterious little Bethlehem. Really, God? What were you thinking? Well, in our scripture for today, the prophet Micah addresses Bethlehem as a little clan. And then as I read the message, it says, but you, Bethlehem, David's country, what did it say? The runt of the litter. Hmm. Why would God choose the runt of the litter as the birthplace of the Christ child, the place where God's only son would be born. And according to Micah, Bethlehem is the location from where a great ruler will come, the ruler who is to bring unity to the people and to the nations, a ruler who will lead with the strength of God, bringing security and peace to the people. And the message reads, and the people will have a good and safe home. For the whole world will hold him in respect, the peacemaker of the world. The runt of the litter produces the peacemaker of the world. Friends, this doesn't make sense. This does not, the scripture does not make sense. God's choices don't make sense. As much as I would like to wrap this hymn up and and the scripture in a beautifully decorated gift and offer it to you for Christmas, we all know that's impossible. Because if we look closely at the Christmas story, we continue to discover things that just don't make sense. God chose an unmarried, poor, teenage immigrant to give birth to the holy child. And this holy child with a bold agenda. From scripture it says, not only will he lift up the lowly, but pull down the mighty. Not just will he feed the hungry, but he will empty the hands of the rich. That's what this holy child, born of a poor immigrant, is to do. And what's more, God chose another poor, although righteous, immigrant carpenter to love a woman whose story he didn't understand, to protect a baby he did not father, and to accept an heir who was not his son. God chose not the designer crib with organic cotton sheets. God chose a stinky, dirty pig trough as the first place Mary and Joseph would lay the holy child. God chose not the religious leaders, ouch. God chose not the rich or powerful, but God chose the lowliest of the low, social outcasts, the shepherds, as the first to see the star of Bethlehem. And it was God who chose Bethlehem, the runt of the litter, as the birthplace of the peacemaker of the world. Friends, in a world where we are abundantly blessed with safety, with security, with privilege, this doesn't make sense to me. In a world where we esteem the wealthy, we value power and influence, we often look down on, ignore, and even exclude those who are different from us. These choices that God made don't make any sense. But Jesus didn't come to make sense. Jesus came 
to make peace. So to God, a peasant virgin, a timid carpenter, a dark little mysterious town and a group of unclean outcasts of society makes perfect sense. That is, if the goal of God's actions is to give birth to love and peace that will transform the world. So friends, during this Advent season, what is our goal? What are we hoping for? What are you working toward as a church? What are we working toward as a United Methodist denomination? As a country? As a community? What are you expecting out of this Christmas? Or, have you thought about it this way? What is God hoping for? What is God expecting from this Christmas? What does God need from you? Who is God choosing for his mission of love and peace to the world? Well, I'll be honest with you, I'm still wrestling with the scripture. I'm still wrestling with the hymn text. And my invitation to you is to join me. Join me in this struggle. My hope is that we'll leave here with way more questions than answers. Questions that will draw us closer to God's presence and God's meaning and purpose for our lives, personally and as a church. I believe questions are acts of faith. One of my favorite preachers, Davis Chapel, currently serving at Brentwood United Methodist, agrees. He says that sometimes a sincere question is what drives us to discover the reality of God's presence. And could that possibly be our greatest desire and goal for this Advent Christmas season? To discover the reality of God's presence. And could that have been Mary and Joseph's desire? To discover the reality of God's presence. And could that have actually been why they were chosen? And why their response to God was yes. Well, here are some of my questions. Join me. God, why do you choose the unexpected and often undesirable to carry out your mission of love and peace? And God, just as you were present in the mystery and the messiness of the nativity, are you truly present in the mystery and the mess of our lives? I don't know about you, but my life gets really messy sometimes. And and God, could you be choosing us? God, could you be choosing Hildale United Methodist? God, could you be choosing me? In the midst of our messy, busy, ordinary life that rarely makes sense, could you be choosing us to show us the reality of your presence? Could you be choosing us to show up as the gift of transforming peace and love? Oh, God. Oh, Oh, God, if and when you do, please help us to recognize you and say yes. Steve Garnis Holmes is a writer and a poet. And this week he shared a poem called Feliz Navidad that I would like to share with you in closing. He writes... We sang Christmas carols in the gym at the prison. The visitors sang out on all the goldies, all those old British tunes in their smooth rhymes, all of the glow ho 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 rias. The inmates mumbled along. 
Everybody sang to the backs of the chairs in front of them. Then we got to Feliz Navidad. We didn't know that one so well. But the guys belted it out with gusto. They sang it to each other. This was their song. Shepherds on the hillside, suddenly given good news in their own language. This is the mystery of Christmas. God has come to sing our song in our language. Not the refined arias of angelic choruses, but the gritty, plain language of life lived. Failed, loved anyway, and saved. Felice Navidad. <clears throat> so, Hildale, keep on loving, keep on learning, keep on serving together. I'm always amazed at the things I hear you are doing to connect with your community. I'm so grateful for your mission. Keep asking, keep seeing, seeking. Keep seeking the reality of God's presence in your life. Keep coming here. Keep coming together to worship, to sing hymns and praises. And be assured that this Advent and this Christmas, God has come to sing your song. God has come in the unexpected, in the mystery, and in the mess. In our language, God is with us. Emmanuel. May we pray. O holy child of Bethlehem, when you least make sense, may we respond with love and peace and trust. O come to us. Abide with us. You are our Lord. Emmanuel. Amen.